Okay, it looks like the, the rate of joining has slowed down. So we'll ease into this slowly and let others um, come in if they're, if they're gonna join, but welcome. Um, thanks for joining. This is a webinar about the upcoming RFP for the LTR synthesis working group proposals. So let's, um, I wanna just uh, introduce myself and then let the team here from the LNO um, introduce themselves briefly, and then we will get into the webinar. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we do that. This is a, a webinar format, not a Zoom meeting. So you've all come in muted, but it's a relatively small group. And so there's a lot of ways to ask questions that I think we can handle today. You can uh, raise your hand and we can actually unmute you and you can just say your question. You also can use the um, Q and A uh, portion of the, it's a Q and A button down at the bottom of the webinar. And in the Q and A, you can type your question. You can do that at any time throughout the presentation and the presentation will be relatively short. Um, and, and you can, uh, on, in the Q and A, a couple things. One, you can do it anonymously if you want and others can actually upvote the question. But again, we have a relatively small group. So, um, you know, we'd like to hear from you if you have questions and you can do that by raising your hand and then Marty will, um, or one of the team will be able to unmute you, okay? So um, my name is Jen Cassell and my role in the LNO for NCES is to uh, run these synthesis working groups and provide other more general support, like special projects for all of the synthesis activities that happen. Um, Marty, and then Nick and Gabe are here. Sure. Uh, Marty Downs, I'm the director of the LTR network office, so uh, often your first point of contact where I will farm questions out to other people. Um, Nick? Yeah, hi, I'm Nick Lyon. I'm a member of the scientific computing support team, um, and we offer a range of services that we'll talk about later in support of the sort of nuts and bolts data stuff that goes into being a working group. And I'm Gabe De La Rosa. I'm the digital communica communications coordinator here at the LTR network. Um, if you've read our newsletter or read something on the website or found something on Twitter, I probably had a hand in putting it out. Great, thanks everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna share my um, screen and let me know, oops, if that comes in. Okay, is that in um, presentation mode, folks? Team? Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, let's get right into it. Today we'll um, go over some of the details of the RFP and, and give you a chance to ask um, questions. We'll be introducing a new kind of working group proposal for this RFP that we're very excited about. I think the most important thing to remember, and it will be several, uh, you'll see this several times, is the deadline for proposal submissions, which is October 12th of 2022. It's a Wednesday and those proposals will be due electronically uh, by 5 p.m. Pacific time. So we'll just keep reminding you of that. I just wanna step back a little bit for those of you who may not be familiar or are less familiar with the LTR network and the network office. But basically our overarching goals are to try to, um, you know, create a network out of the network, enhance communication, collaboration, synthesis, training and engagement across the entire LTR network. We are um, physically hosted and resident at the at NCS, which is the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, and this is part of the University of California at Santa Barbara. So the NCS has a very long history of um, supporting and uh, designing synthesis type science. And at our center, we have a lot of facilities and a lot of different sorts of um, of staff and training opportunities that we can provide. And so essentially we've got virtual meeting facilities, but also really good in-house meeting facilities. Um, we have a great server set up where we can help working groups uh, manage their data, um, also teach you how to remotely access our servers. We'll get into this a little bit more, but we've got very comprehensive um, computing capabilities, both in terms of infrastructure and people to help. 
uh, and increasingly we're able to provide training and consultation for um, visiting scientists that would be you all if um, awarded a synthesis proposal on informatics computation and and collaboration skills so really soft and hard skills um, we moved into a new office approximately one year ago now marty has it been a full year yeah, last summer. So really, really nice um, building in downtown Santa Barbara. We're located off the UC campus, UC Santa Barbara campus, and um, just can provide, like, it's not only uh, uh, an excellent place to work, it's, it's for so many reasons. It's just such a nice spot. It's beautiful and um, a really good place to visit and a really good place to, to get, you know, really um, comprehensive work done. Okay. So to the proposal, uh, to the RFP itself, it is uh, focused on the LTER network. And so we're very interested in proposals that um, revolve around the five core LTER thematic areas and two emerging um, social ecological thematic areas. And these are here, but uh, primary production, population studies, organic matter, inorganic matter and disturbance have been key LTR themes um, since the inception of LTR. Um, we're also particularly interested in the social ecological um, components of land use, land cover changes are one example, and human environment interactions, including um, urban settings. That said, Proposals that are likely to return really high impact in other areas um, will be considered for the call. Okay, we'll talk about the, in a minute about the, the typical full, what we're calling the full working group, but I'm going to preempt that with a, a really exciting new um, proposal type that we're introducing this year. We're calling it SPARC, Scientific Peers Advancing Research Collaboration. And essentially, SPARC proposals will be for a single um, small group workshop. And so by that, we mean up to about 12 people for about four days. And, and unlike the full two-year uh, research proposals or, or synthesis proposals that um, include several uh, meetings per year at NC Spark is for just a single small group workshop. So the expected outcomes from this type of proposal can be quite varied. Um, and we're looking for really creative um, proposals in this that that suggest uh, what what folks can provide as an output. So for example, um, perhaps a, a paper that's near completion or needs a, a, a really dedicated in-house like four-day meeting to get over the hump. Um, planning meetings for future research or for future papers uh, would, would fit into a spark per, 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 um, uh, perhaps. And also research coordination efforts. So where a single meeting might be able to get a group together and really consolidate uh, moving forward as a collaboration or a coordination effort would all um, these would all fit under uh, a spark. What we'll need to see is that um, that that basically whatever is proposed can be done in the form of a single multi-day um, concentrated effort. So while spark proposals will be budgeted for a single workshop uh, at NCS, that doesn't mean that there there um, wouldn't be preparatory or follow-up meetings leading up to the in-house meeting at NCS and then following on to get the products done. And so we can provide logistical support, support for virtual preparatory or follow-up meetings for those. But again, um, the proposal budget will, will budget for one in-person meeting at NCS. Now, these proposals have just slightly different requirements. And so please, I urge you to read the RFP carefully for components of a full proposal that might not be required for SPARC proposals. Um, they're very, very similar. Both proposal formats are pretty short, so they're very, very similar, but there's a few things that we're not going to ask for for SPARC proposals. And I'll try to highlight some of those as I go through, but I think they're very clearly highlighted in the written RFP as well. And we're always available for asking questions as you're preparing your proposals. If you have any questions, you know, you can email Marty, you can email myself, and our contacts are on the RFP. 
So here's just a little bit of an outline. I, I said I was going to go over what a full working group looks like, and we'll get a little more into this at the at near the end as well. But a full proposal is typically about four, sometimes three, depending on COVID, um, four day working group meetings uh, of about 12 people. So the full proposal is typically a two year duration, although a full proposal can also be put in for a one year project with a couple meetings. And so you as the, as the proposer will have to decide whether you fit better in a full proposal or a spark proposal. Um, some of the meetings for these full proposals may be held offsite, and by offsite, I mean away from NCs. So they may, you may consider an in-person meeting, but not at NCs. Again, we provide preparatory and follow-up virtual, virtual support um, for those, and the budgets for these are not to exceed about $110,000 for two years, so fifty-five dollars per year. Whereas, as I said, a SPARC proposal is a single approximately four-day meeting of approximately 12 people. I keep saying approximately because there's no hard and fast rules here, but we know from past experience what tends to work best for these kinds of synthesis groups, and these are about the targets that tend to work best. The SPARC proposal meeting must be on site at NCS, and that's um, barring complete COVID catastrophe, which we will talk about um, the, the way things are looking. Um, the proposal should be, pro you should be proposing your single meeting at NCs. And again, the prep and follow-up support will be given and budget not to exceed about $20,000. So I'm not gonna go over this timeline in detail, but this is a really nice graphic that Marty and the team came up with that sort of overviews what a full working group um, and synthesis work might entail. I put this up largely to um, provide to, to point you to that URL there. The team at the LNO and NCs in general have spent a lot of time accumulating and, um, and posting resources about synthesis, what it is, how it works best, what you can get out of it, what are some of the challenges, how do you maybe overcome those. And so I would really like to, um, to point you to this URL on our website. You also can just go in, find the LNO website, go to synthesis and look for synthesis resources. And, um, and you know, you really could learn a lot that might help you in preparation of your proposal if you haven't been involved in synthesis working groups. And maybe even if you have, um, you might find these resources really um, useful. So again, I'm not gonna walk you through this, this graphic, but this, this and other um, really extensive resources are available to you. Okay, the more nitty gritty, who's eligible to apply uh, for one of these um, synthesis working group proposals? Any individual holding any position in an academic institution, a freestanding research institution, maybe your affiliation is a scientific society, government and policy agencies are all eligible as are NGOs and consortiums of such institutions. So um, essentially there are very few limits on who can apply. Any nationality, um, we'll talk about diverse working groups in a minute. Um, and so, um, yeah. The key here though, is that any um, successful working group in this particular call for proposals should include one or more LTR researchers. These are people who are familiar with LTR sites um, and data that will be used in the analysis. So that's not to say that you need uh, a site PI, for example, or even a site co-PI, but we will be looking for uh, a familiarity with the data sets that you're proposing to use um, and uh, yeah, and a facility with that. So researchers is writ large at any level. Um, Okay, we have found in our, in our experience, a long experience at NCs, that uh, working groups that that really that provide uh, or include a diverse array of participants are highly successful for a lot of reasons. And again, I'd actually point you towards the uh, LNO website and DEI resources, where we also have put together a lot of very specific resources um, and readings uh, and background on how 
diversity can really um, increase productivity and, and outputs from these kinds of synthesis working groups. And so with that in mind, we will be looking at um, the diversity of participants who are committed to the project. And um, we mean that taking into consideration gender balance, career stage, and any opportunities to include individuals from underrepresented institutions and groups. We also have found that increasing opportunities for EC, ECRs, early career researchers, and also graduate students can really propel a career for those younger, um, younger folks, so, or those early career folks. So we are um, interested in ways to increase opportunities. Graduate students have worked on synthesis working groups before. Many of our past working groups have been led by postdocs, um, and that's totally appropriate as well. Um, again, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but as you are assembling your team of participants for your group, if you are wanting any either advice or help identifying potential participants, um, contact uh, the office, contact Marty, contact myself, and we're happy to talk to groups about how to um, increase diversity in your working group. And that may be just general advice, but it also may be um, with our sort of, you know, deep knowledge of the LTR network and the, and the people in it, we may be able to help you even identify potential participants in your group. Okay, we have a, a, a few sort of prescriptive rules about the data that you're going to use, and we, um, we require the use of existing LTR data from more than one site. So these, to be a true synthesis and take on really, um, you know, really um, wicked questions and really do synthesis the way it should be, uh, it, this wouldn't, you wouldn't be uh, proposing a single site um, data set. So, but beyond more than one site, we're not particularly prescriptive, but we also so basically two sites or more for LTR data. But we also really, really welcome the inclusion of other long-term data sets from other sources. This may be data sets from individual researchers. It might also be compiled data sets from other networks. Here's a few examples, CZO, NEON, OBFS, ILTR, or site data from an LTREB, um, other looser consortium such as NutNet data has been used before and um, yeah, NewNet. So uh, basically, yeah, we're looking for a variety of different kinds of data, long-term data, um, and it can come from a variety of different sources, but we do require uh, L core LTR data from, one, uh, from more than one site. We also have uh, data um, network, we have data access policies. And so if, oh, if we encourage you to take a look at the policies and um, you must agree to these before you can uh, proceed with a funded working group. So basically the data access policy is linked here and you can find it at that URL. But in general, it's really important that groups document and make any of the derived data publicly available. And we can, um, on a fairly short timeline, but that's, uh, we can talk about that, that's in the data access policy. And we will help you do that. Um, we can help you uh, um, create metadata, can help you document in, um, on EDI or uh, other repositories um, if, if you're already, if you're unfamiliar with that. So we can provide support for that. On that note, we find that it works well with our data science team who will be providing support to your working groups if each full working groups designates a data science liaison. So somebody that our scientific computing team can work with on the computing needs, collaboration capabilities, so just project management, but data management and processing, including what I just said, creating metadata and, and distribution, making your data public, but also analytical needs. So these are identifying a data science liaison is required for full working groups. This is one of those things that is not required for Spark groups. Although I will say that if a Spark uh, proposal is proposing some pretty heavy computing, 
in your one meeting that you're going to propose, it's okay to also designate a data science liaison and for some of the support that we'll be able to give. This could be, so this could be a PI, it could be a site IM, could be an early career researcher and really any other working group member who has agreed to fulfill this role and support and training will be provided for this. Now, I wanna pop out now to see if Nick Lyon, who's part of our um, data science team and, and supporting these working groups has anything to add here, Nick? Sure, yeah, I would say, um, yeah, crucial to identify a single person, but that doesn't mean, you know, were you to get funded, that doesn't mean that that person has to be the sole point of contact. Um, uh, current working groups have had success with uh, like sub projects, either individual sub papers or sometimes down to specific tasks have had like a specific point person who isn't necessarily the specified data science liaison. So don't don't feel as though this person would need to carry the total weight of communicating with our team. We, we don't buy. We're happy to talk with anyone on your on your group. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Great, thanks, Nick. Okay, is this again? Would this be a good time for Nick to talk a little bit about the kind of support that is available? Yeah, I think so. I I think so. I was going to see if any questions had been queued up at this point, but I don't see any in the yeah. Q and A. And Marty, you're tracking the hands up, so yeah, I think it would. Um, this is a really important part of these working groups. It's a place where we can really, really help your groups and also provide some formal training as well. So it, there's a lot more that that you know you can get out of these synthesis working groups. So this would be a good time. So Nick, do you wanna do you wanna go on a little bit more detail about both training and uh, the computing um, capabilities of your team? And we should just call out to Julian Brun as well as another member of this team. Um, and Angel Chen, who are not here on this working group. So Nick is, I'm sorry, not here on this webinar. So Nick is um, is representing a larger team here. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just me. Um, yeah, so I would say on the, on the training fund, uh, we offer like workshops. Um, so far, they've only been in the sort of two hour territory, but we could go longer potentially if that was of interest to your group. And those workshops can be on things like programming in the tidyverse in R, um, we've done a GitHub workshop that was quite successful. We're also happy to build tutorials if you'd rather have something that was a little more standalone. Um, in terms of the actual synthesis support, we're capable of working directly with you. So we sit down next to you, we jump on a Zoom with you or multiple members of your team, and we work on some specific analytical challenge that you have. But we can also function autonomously. Um, some of our existing working groups have said, oh, you know, it'd be so great if I had land cover data from all of the regions that I'm working in. And they said, can you go find that for us? And so we found a couple of sources and then had a dialogue with them about which source best fit their needs. And then eventually after that conversation concluded, we showed up with a ready-made set of precisely the data that they required. So sort of that gradient about how much autonomy you would want to give us. Um, I would say the only caveat is while we're happy to help with data wrangling, to some extent, our primary purpose is analytical. So if you have some substantive wrangling challenge to then get to a synthesis thing, that's great. Um, but if you're trying to do sort of an ongoing wrangle this site, now wrangle this site, that's the sort of thing where we might try and instead offer some sort of training support to help you feel uh, more confident in doing that uh, more on your own. Um, am I? Am I missing anything? I feel like that was the the two. We have the science, the synthesis support, and we have the training support. Uh, I think maybe just the idea of sort of the concentrated effort on a particular task. So the um, yeah. um, yeah. the we we are very excited. Having analysts on board is a relatively new thing at the network office, uh, and we're really pleased to be able to offer some sort of concrete analytical support. And one of the ways that that is working is that a working group will request a sort of, uh, I forget, we had we had sort of a clever name for them, but- I think they were analytical sprints. Sprints, exactly. So uh, a short-term, um, this discrete project, 
you know, might require an analyst for a month or six weeks, pretty much full time. Uh, and you can sort of submit those requests through Julian and we'll negotiate a little bit about timing and, and who's going to work on that. But um, keep that in mind as you're putting proposals together um, that that it isn't that you're going to have to pull a grad student or a postdoc off of whatever else they're working on for that chunk of time. Uh, and we do, Jen, if you want to pause for a minute, have a question in the Q&A. Great. Uh, um, yeah, thanks. I'm also, I'm going to stop sharing for a second because the Q&A has, has blocked my screen for some reason and I can't make it go away. So go on, you read it and I'll stop um, sharing and share so, again. I just don't want to confuse uh, people. Sydney Record asked, do you have a sense of how many Spark versus traditional two-year working groups will be funded this year? Um, I think I can take we back. Do. Have, uh, we're saying two to four of either, and it depends a bit on the balance of the quality of the proposals that we get. That's right. And we'll get to that at the end too. I think we have that in a slide, but that's that's correct. Okay, this is a good time to pause anyway, if anybody has any questions on anything so far. Data science. Okay, well, we'll have we'll have time as well at the end. So moving on, um, I've removed the blocking Q&A out of my way. So, okay, so there are some fairly specific rules on what can be funded and what cannot be funded. And this is important. So these um, this funding is dedicated towards um, meeting travel and lodging and per diem. We um, have been able to fund some publication costs as well towards the end of projects or even after. Um, and the LNO, to be clear, reimburses actual expenses. Um, and that's all, all work that's all reimbursed through the LNO office. What is not appropriate and cannot be funded by um, this mechanism, this RFP and this, these synthesis groups is any collection of new data or field research, um, and as well as any overhead or funds to be spent by the investigators at their home institution. And then as well, activities that primarily address the, the sort of stated goals of another organization. And then in answer to, was it Sydney's question? Um, this is what we think we're looking at for this RFP. And again, it will depend on the budgets and so forth, but two to four full groups that um, are up to a two year duration and maybe three, maybe, or three, maybe four spark groups for that, that um, designated one year, one meeting. Marty, do you have anything to add to this in terms of other funding requests that have come in that we can't or cannot um, fund or can potentially fund? Um, no, I, th I think that's pretty clear. Uh, the, the bottom line is basically that we, we are able to, that we fund the work directly rather than giving you the money. Uh, and so that allows us to, I, it allows us to fund that very wide range of collaborators that Jen showed at the beginning. So that's one of the reasons that we're able to fund international participants or we're able to fund um, uh, collaborators from organizations that might not otherwise be eligible to directly receive NSF funding. Right. Okay. Um, okay, no uh, webinar having to do with upcoming meetings would be complete without some discussion of COVID. We can only say what we're doing now. We cannot predict the future. That said, we are having full working groups running um, right now at NCS, but you know, we are open, depending on what's going on, to the full working groups running some virtual meetings or some smaller group meetings in other venues. And I should say that actually that's not just necessarily COVID related. We are actually open, COVID or non-COVID, we are open to considering some virtual meetings or some smaller group meetings in other venues. But in doing so, there really has to be good justification because of the support that we can provide groups when they are here at NCs. But that said, in relation to COVID, there may be good reasons depending on what's going on with COVID. Um, Spark meeting really does, it's a single meeting and it needs to take place at NCS. Um, and so we may just have to work around COVID for that depending on what's going on. 
We get a lot of questions though about, well, how should I budget? And we, we want to see budgets that budget as if all the in-person meetings will proceed in California um, or a meeting or two in other locations close to the institution. So we don't want to see a lot of, of uh, we basically are looking to budget as if COVID is not going to be a consideration, as if travel is okay. And we will work with teams to redo budgets if we need to, depending on what's going on. Um, we can, again, I've said this several times, we can provide, um, you know, increased technical and logistical support and training for the use of virtual meetings and virtual collaboration if those do need to proceed. Um, but uh, we can't, we can only say what's happening now, which is NCS is, is fully open. We are running full working group meetings um, back to back in some cases. And it's all gone okay so far. Um, we have been able to do hybrid meetings a little bit better. So working groups are able to uh, zoom in a participant or two or three or however many with, um, with most of the team in uh, person. So, but I think the biggest point here is budget as if you're doing in-person meetings at NCs. I just add, Jen, um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also make a plan for the for related virtual meetings between your in-person meetings. And we'd love to see in the proposal that that you've thought about how those fit together. Um, the virtual meetings, which we're all much better at these days, can really help keep the momentum going between the in-person meetings. Right. Thanks for that, Marty, for sure. And we can help you with, with support for those meetings, either technical, um, mostly technical and logistical. So, so a question in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, Lillian Aoki asks, in terms of the data science support from analysts, does it make sense to identify areas where an analyst could support a project within the proposal? especially if there are data integration or analysis elements that might be more feasible with analyst support? And are there specific guidelines in terms of limits on the time or effort from an analyst that can be expected? That is a really great question. Um, at the, the first part, yes, I think it would be very helpful to identify and indicate that you've given thought to where uh, one of our analysts could help. Um, in terms of, you know, detailing the amount and the timing and all that, that's been a sort of, as, as was mentioned several times by Marty and Nick, that's been a sort of a, and negotiation is too strong a word, but a sort of, we kind of work it out um, as it goes. So it would really be helpful to identify in your proposal what you're thinking. Um, and I don't, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Marty? Um, we can so evaluate or... A yeah. general guideline for thinking about that is to recognize that we'll have, uh, so we will still have some working groups who are continuing to work from the previous cohort, uh, and we'll have about three new working groups. So we'll have, say, six active full working groups and maybe three more spark working groups and two analysts. So if you kind of divide that time up, I would not expect to have more than two analytical sprints in a year devoted to an individual working group. Um, I, I think that's kind of a reasonable, Nick, do you have? Yeah, and I would just add that um, outside of the analytical sprints, we can definitely chip away at larger tasks. Um, and several of the working groups um, we found success with uh, primarily through something like GitHub, but essentially sharing the code back and forth. And we'll take it a little bit because at the end of the day, you all are the like topic experts and, and we we are purely carpenters in this. We bring a set of tools that we understand in a, in a coding context. And so a lot of it is like, we'll build a tool and then you all will take a look at it and say, okay, actually, I, I wish that it did this slightly differently. Um, and that back and forth means it's really it's much more feasible to sort of juggle tasks among working groups. So don't feel like we're only going to be sprinting for you and then totally MIA until the next sprint. Right. And then there's also uh, there is some uh, advantage of scale in terms of the training. So uh, Nick and Angel and Julian have already built training modules for GitHub and 
tidyverse and those are going to be much easier to deliver if you have a new area that you're sort of interested in digging into uh, that would be helpful for your whole group to have uh, a little bit more expertise in it'll take a little bit longer for them to build up a new module around that does that answer your question Lillian pretty well oh you're muted sorry <laughs> there's a yeah, in the chat. Okay, this is repetitive, but um, it's it's worth repeating. It's sort of basic guidelines on what we find works best for meetings and group size and, and the budgets that we're looking for. So essentially full proposals, we estimate, oh, chat's disabled for, okay. Um, about 55K per year, 110 for a full proposal for two years. And the SPARC proposals we've um, estimated should come in at 20,000 or less. We do find that um, you know, 12, maybe up to 15 scientists is, is really a, a very effective number for these kinds of synthesis working groups. We have seen groups um, get up to about 18. Four day meetings tend to be um, a, a really good amount as well for productivity and each working group, a full working group tends to meet two to, to three times a year. I mean, that, that was prior to COVID. Things have changed since then. There's, um, well, let me finish this slide and then there's something I want to add about um, the participants in your working group. So SPARC groups, we think about 12 participants working at NCs for a single four-day meeting. And then importantly, partial support from other institutions or agencies and co-funding, it's welcome, but it is not required in these proposals. We are not requiring matching funds or leveraged funds, but um, mentioning them in the proposal if you have them. And that may be through providing um, participants, other participants like a postdoc or grad student working on this or so forth. Um, I do want to say though that, um, and Marty, you can, you can follow up on this and probably articulate it better than I can, but in terms of the size of your working group, we also have found that, you know, there may be subgroups within your groups of people with particular expertise. And so, you know, we've seen groups get up to about 18, but, you know, six to eight working together on one topic. And at every single meeting, not necessarily everybody has come to NCS as well. So, there are, um, there are possibilities for, I guess, subgroups is the best way to describe it. Um, that said, we still are gonna be looking for a participant list and in the proposal documents, there will be a table of this and whether folks are committed or not and what their expertise is, but work may proceed in a subgroup fashion. Marty, do you wanna um, either <laughs> articulate that better or add to that? Um... No, I, I thought that covered it pretty well. I, I mean, examples of how that has worked has have been sort of a, a subgroup of empiricists and a subgroup of modelers that frame a, a problem together and then go off and work a little bit separately and then come back together. Um, some groups have done a, a smaller core group that helps kind of frame the problem, broadened out for a meeting in the middle that uh, brings in a lot of people with experience of data from, from a wide variety of sites. So they're, they're participating and they're feeding back on the general framing, but there's a smaller group that does the framing. Uh, and then again, narrowing uh, at the end to do the writing. Uh, so, so lots of variations. It doesn't have to be the same 12 people at every single meeting. Yeah, thank you for that. The examples are really helpful. I'm not sure if any of you, we, I do see a question in the chat, the Q&A. So we will, um, let me see. Let's actually take that now. Can you read it, Marty? I'm still- Yeah, um, sure. Really uh, when it comes to budget, how much should be reserved towards costs associated with hosting the meetings at NCs? I.e., are there room rental costs and other fees that should be incorporated in the budget related to hosting meetings at NCs? Uh, I see that there are budget lines for items related to meetings not at NCs. So does this mean there are no charges associated with hosting the meeting at NCs other than lodging, travel, and food? And yes, that's correct. Uh, so the 
cost of sort of meeting rooms at NCs and snacks at NCs. And it's one of the reasons that we encourage having the meetings here is that those are built into the LNO budget. Um, so there, there can be good reasons for hosting meetings somewhere else. Um, we we think and experience shows that there are also a lot of advantages for doing it at NCs. One of which is that it's a, it's much easier for us to connect you with other groups and other people and to sort of track what's happening with meetings and be directly supportive of that. Uh, but also it is super helpful to get away from your home institutions for a little while. Um, that that distance from, you know, the calls and the students and the and just the kind of mental space is incredibly helpful. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that it makes sense to have it here. Uh, there there are sometimes reasons that it will make sense to have it somewhere else. We have, you know, uh, we've had writing groups of people that are all on the East Coast within an hour and a half of each other. Um, and, you know, and they're able to identify some place where they can all get off campus and meet together. And so we're not averse to that. Um, but but yes, it is. There are no. There's none of that those charging for meeting rooms and coffee and snacks and all of that that you run into if you have to uh, if you decide that you want to meet somewhere else. Yeah, thanks, Marty. And I just want to add to that that the budget um, we've provided a budget template in the downloadable information for this and for the RFP. And so hopefully that will help um, guide you in in understanding how much it might cost for travel. And we've put approximate prices and things like that. But we're also willing to to help you with that during your proposal preparation. So if you have any other questions on that, once you start looking into that template, um, please reach out to us. Um, quickly, if any of you, we've this we've been doing this for quite a few years now. We made a pretty major change this year in in introducing the Spark proposals, but we also made some pretty um, big changes to the art to the um, the solicitation and what's required from some of the earlier 2016 to 18 RFPs. Um, and those are just briefly, and again, this is a little bit repetitive, but we've moved a the data sources table out into its own document and it's no longer required in the word count for your proposals. These are pretty small proposals. They don't have a huge word count. So um, now it's it's more clear where you can put uh, what data sets you, it, you anticipate using or are sure you're going to use. As we've talked about, we every year we have upped the, the role in the, um, of the support and training for, oh, sorry, we used to call it the technical liaison. We're calling it the data science liaison now and the workflows. And then again, here's that link to synthesis resources on our website. And we've put a lot of effort into compiling and curating those. So I really urge you to go, um, you know, and a lot of this is from our own experience running um, these, these synthesis working groups. Okay, probably what you're all interested in is what, what are we looking for? Um, how, are, how are proposals evaluated and what are they evaluated for? And again, this is um, pretty clearly written out in the RFP, but basically we, at the highest level, we are looking for um, strong scientific merit and novel approaches, and in particular contribution to LTER network science. This funding comes um, to support the LTR network. So um, there's got to be an LTR component to it. Um, we, as mentioned before, are looking for participant diversity um, and also participant expertise, both scientific and technical. So proposals will be evaluated to see is, is this the right group to do what uh, the proposal is um, proposing to do? So is the expertise there. Um, the proposal review process includes um, uh, what we do is we, we have a review panel that we assemble and this panel includes LTER scientists. So defined really as kind of core to LTR. These are folks who you know, are in sites or have a very, very strong background with LTR sites. And then an equal number of non-LTR scientists. So those who, they may be familiar with LTR, but they wouldn't in any way be considered core um, or have a huge background with LTR um, sites or LTR science. 
The panel um, reviews, every proposal is reviewed by um, at least two, but usually way more than that um, of this panel. And then the panel meets to uh, come up with a prioritized list, but the final a list of, of, yeah, a ranked, a ranked list of proposals, but the final decision on funding is made by the um, LNO executive director in consultation with the chair of the executive board. Um, and so the, um, the uh, list and the panel discussions and the notes will be provided to those um, two folks who will make the final decision. We sometimes come in um, after, or we come in during the whole panel process and um, talk to proposers about modifications to the proposal. These may include adjustments to the working group size or the composition. This sometimes is meant to be helpful with if we know about additional data resources that might be available and um, more infrequently adjustments to uh, the budget as well. So I know there may be maybe questions about this, but we're almost done here and then we can open it up to open questions. Um, these are the key dates. Obviously today is the webinar, the proposal due date, really important, October 12th, 5 p.m. Proposals can be submitted electronically, but if anybody has any problems doing that, please contact us and we'll find other way to get your proposal to us before Wednesday, October 12th. The awards are announced in early January and the projects um, can begin as early as February of 2023. Um, and so we awarded projects. We will um, very shortly after the, um, the awards are announced, we'll, we will reach out to the successful PIs and start to um, have meetings with them to help guide uh, the beginning and the sort of kickoff of the groups. And that can be, again, uh, technical and data science resources, everything from that to helping, you know, create a good working group agendas. Um, we're pretty good at that and so forth. Um, there's one other thing, Gabe, I don't want to put you on the spot, but one other thing that I realize we don't have in the slide deck right now is just um, how we can also help working successful working groups um, throughout their, uh, their, per, their work with out, outreach and communications. Do you want to just say something for a minute or two on, on your role in supporting these working groups? And I'm sorry, yeah, totally. no slide. I think it got axed. <laughs> My bad. No worries. Um, so my role here at the network office is to get all the cool research out to the world and let people know about what's happening in all the working groups. Um, and so we do this in a variety of ways. Um, you know, when you have results, of course, if you publish a paper, we, we can disseminate that in our newsletter. We can write a story about it on our website. We can post about it on Twitter. Um, and we generally get these out to thousands of people. So it's a pretty widespread with the, with the network office. Um, something I'm trying to sort of incorporate more of now that we're in, into the sort of kind of post COVID era um, is starting to tell the world about what's happening uh, during working groups. So what, it act, what the actual process looks like when you're working, uh, when you're here at NCs or doing stuff, you know, um, at your home institutions. Um, but yeah, so we, we have a suite of, you know, a suite of things that we put out um, this year. A couple of years ago, we did a, a series of webinars on uh, intermediate progress for all the working groups. Um, so they were a little five minute overview videos, um, just having somebody speak, tell about what your working group's focusing on, what your plan is, what you've done already. Um, and we really like to sort of get people uh, in the know on what the nitty gritty looks like, what these, uh, what the, the year one progress is on a two year project or something. Um, and so there are a variety of ways we can get this out and we have a huge reach. So um, we're totally willing to work with you. And uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, uh, Kate. Okay, I'm I'll stopping right note, here. Those videos are a really nice resource for, uh, for you also, as you start to think about what works in a working group to kind of take a look at some of those. And I will drop the, um, the link to the playlist in the chat in a minute. Great, thanks. And two um, question came in, and I'm really sorry that um, I took more time than I had anticipated. So um, what is the latest that a working group could begin? 
so the the money could be available, like the budget could get all set up as early as February. Um, and usually groups uh, try to get going and get on the calendar for their first working group meeting, either in the late spring or summer. Um, that's, that's what we would hope since these projects are only two years, it's best to get going um, quickly, but that, that, you know, we are flexible in that. It, it can be hard, I know, is finding out you, you get an award, you know, in January and getting a group together by spring to travel that we, we realize that can be difficult, but we would want to start working with the group right away to try to make that happen if possible spring or summer. Sometimes for the first working groups have been as late as um, late summer of well, As people are joining, I'm going to oh, just introduce really myself here. and talk for a moment about the long-term oh, ecological oh, research oh, sorry. network. Marty, you can mute yourself. Yeah. Webinar um, uh, welcome. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I was saying that I think the latest the working group has started was, you know, that late that first summer. This was just pre-COVID. COVID threw everything off. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and in the chat, um, Sydney asked if these slides will be made available. Absolutely. We will put both the slides and the recording um, on the page where the RFP is on our website. So does anybody have any other questions? Again, we can you can raise your hand as well and we can um, we can call on you or you can type in the Q&A. The other thing I did, I forgot to mention that would be quite useful is um, have a look at the uh, past working groups, the currently funded groups and the past working groups on the LNO website. You can see what has been proposed in the past. And one thing that's already really, really neat and starting to happen is as those prior working groups have put together um, big data sets and data resources, and they're made available, we, we really encourage the building of these new groups on the work that some of the other past working groups have done. So perhaps another working group has created a really great data, data package or a, a, you know, a data set that's now clean and ready to be used. Maybe it could be used for totally different questions. Um, and, and that would be great. Okay, so I see no more no more direct questions in any of the the way. Oh wait, there's a message. Okay, um, nor and I also see people starting to sort of drop off. So I guess we can end it here. Um, you now know. Oh, there's great. Thanks, Sydney, for all the good questions. Here's uh, another one. If we have co-funding support, how should that enter the budget? Oh, that's a really good question. Usually it just comes in in the text part of the um, of the proposal itself, not in the formal budget, since we don't require co-funding and we don't require match and we don't really want to open up messy administrative doors by showing something that looks like match when it's not required, both in your institution and ours. Usually that just goes in the text of the proposal. Okay, another quick question. Is there a catalog of data products from past synthesis working groups? Great question. Nick, I'm gonna turn that over to you. The answer is, is yes. Um, what was that, Marty? Uh, yes, sort of. Yes, so, uh, that's why I said yes, <laughs> with a kind of rise in my voice. Uh, so I, I'm actually gonna start that and then okay. if he has anything to add, he can. Uh, EDI, of course, has um, has some of them, uh, particularly things like the um, the soil organic matter outputs. Uh, I know are in EDI. Uh, we are still prodding some of our prior working groups to get their final um, derived data products into EDI. So the alternative place to look is under the working groups themselves. So. When you click into each working group, if you search for the topic of the working group and then click into it, all of the recent working groups have a list of products associated with them. And, uh, and those will have sometimes data papers, sometimes um, the, the actual data sets in EDI or uh, occasionally elsewhere.
Yeah, thanks, Greg, for that. Okay, any other questions? Again, you'll, you have um, contact information for both Marty and myself on the RFP, and we really urge you to reach out if you have any questions about preparing your pro proposal um, and or um, identifying diverse participants or just questions about how working groups run. I think, again, you'll uh, find a lot of information on our website, but please do reach out to us. Um, yeah, and hopefully that was helpful. Um, great, thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks for the thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the recording of the webinar and the slides will be available on the on the RFP page within a couple of days. Great. Okay, with that, we other will folks end. Also, pardon? I said if you want to share it with other folks, also that's the place to point them to. Exactly. Please share this widely. I'd yep. like to see a, right. a vibrant list of proposals. So thanks, everybody. And with that, we'll stop recording and we'll end the webinar. Thank you. Thanks.